Hello, everyone. I'm always so happy to see who's here and to be able to share with you our wonderful monthly free webinars. I know how much people appreciate the information that you gain from every single one of them. And today is a really special presentation, something that will probably stay with you for a very long time in a very most special and wonderful way. So I am going to get started on my part so we can turn it over to our speaker. My name is Rita Wolfson. I founded Financial Social Work 25 years ago. It sounds like a long time, I guess, because it is a long time. So our speaker today is Tanya Briggins, and she's one special lady. And I'm so appreciative of her willingness to share her story and some of the things that she learned that could be helpful to all of us. Thank you, Tanya. And you can tell people more about yourself when I turn it over to you. So uh, most commonly asked questions and some suggestions. Um, Olga is here with us and she takes good care of us in the question box and in the chat box. Um, so she's going to have some messages for you. We're going to have a wonderful handout that Tanya made for all of you. We don't share the slides, but the recording will be up on Facebook and YouTube and our website in a day or so. Uh, you can type your questions into the question box and we will answer as many as we possibly can at the end of the presentation. There are no Yes. Uh, are you sharing your screen now? Uh, I am, but you're not seeing it? Yeah, can, can you please try again? Okay. Show screen would probably be helpful. Thank you. All right. Okay. Olga, do you think I should start over or just keep going? I think it, um, you can just keep going, You mm, unless you think we skip anything on your slides all right no oh, let's just keep going tanya you're just gonna have to introduce yourself further since they didn't see the slide about you thanks for letting me know leah okay so there are no ce's or certificates for this very special webinar just great information and learning um and you can see that olga puts into the uh, chat box if you have any problems with go to webinar today. I like to begin with our financial social work affirmation because I think it really captures what financial social work is about. It goes just for today. I will love myself enough to face my fears, practice self-acceptance and embrace hope. I will silence my inner critic, speak my truths, and make peace with myself and with my past. Just for today, I will give myself permission to eliminate toxic people, beliefs, and behaviors from my life. And I will prepare for a better tomorrow by healing my relationship with my money and myself today. I always ask everyone on our trainings, and Zooms and anywhere else before we start talking about money to take a deep breath in. And exhale it slowly. We know that money brings up so many different thoughts and feelings for people. So we want you to get comfortable. Take one more deep breath in. Let it out. And we'll get started. Yep, definitely time to get started. We know that no one chooses to have money problems, but unfortunately, too many people do. Why? Well, I think it's because we have rampant 
financial illiteracy. Are there other reasons? Oh, yes, there are many, many reasons. But if we aren't going to end financial illiteracy, we are only going to continue to raise generation after generation of financially illiterate men and women who just don't know how to do better. So this is what I call the cycle of financial illiteracy, where our money problems cause stress, and trauma, anxiety, depression. And because of those problems and the stress and trauma, too often people choose to believe that avoiding or ignoring all of those problems and trauma uh, is a form of financial self-care when actually it is anything but. It's really financial self-sabotaging because when you avoid them, you end up with physical, mental, emotional, psychological, and social problems. And by self-sabotaging, you create a money disconnect. And when we're disconnected from our money, we're ignoring it. It only, as you see in step five, escalates all of and intensifies all of those problems and stress. And that's when things really spiral out of control. So another way of looking at it is that children watch their parents making poor financial decisions and they don't learn anything about money in school. So they internalize those observed habits and develop limited financial literacy that is possibly and very potentially more harmful than helpful. And they grow up not knowing how to make the best financial choices. Money is always the elephant in the room. Why? Because it's still a taboo topic. Here we are, May 2022, and there really is no safe place to learn or talk about money. And the fact that financial health and wellness are about much more than dollars, cents, debt, math, and budgets. This we know because financial illiteracy is a major fact in the challenges of financial behavioral health, which is a phrase that I put together because it's so obvious. Oh, financial problems, stress, anxiety, trauma. They, they really, they affect us emotionally, physically, mentally, socially, and in so many other ways. So let's take a quick look at what financial social work is, and now we're going to turn this right over to our guest speaker. So financial social work is the intersection of politics, the economy, social work, economic, gender, and social justice. There's a lot of pieces to it. And today, more than ever, there are millions of men and women who need help with all of these different areas. So we explore uh, the financial health fundamentals. That psychosocial piece is about the thoughts, feelings, attitudes, beliefs, values, and experiences we all have around money. It is a behavioral model. It looks at how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. And the reason this is such a huge and important piece is because until and unless behavior changes, nothing changes. 
which is why I said earlier that it's about so much more than dollar cents debt budgets. You've got to look at that behavior. So the heart core of financial social work is about healing our relationship with money and our relationship with ourselves. So that's self-discovery, self-care, self-healing. And it's about recognizing and taking ownership of our own financial futures. Financial social work model is interactive, reflective, and strengths-based. It's educational, motivational, and supportive. It is definitely holistic, multidisciplinary, and healing. It has a strong hope component. It has a long history of being helpful to professionals and to their clients. And it works beautifully individually with clients or with client groups. And we have graduates across this country and around the world practicing financial social work. So now you can see a picture of our guest speaker, Tanya. And you will now, I am going to give her the pre presentation. And Tanya, your turn. Perfect. Hello, can can everybody hear me? Hope yes. you can. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Rita, for the invitation to present present this webinar today. And good afternoon. Um, I'm very humbled that you've asked me to do this. And I will do my best to give the participants useful information. So my name is Tanya Briggins, and I'm a licensed social worker with the state of Alabama. I received my bachelor's and master's degree in social work from Alabama A&M University. And I have been in this field for over 20 years. I spent 12 years investigating child sex abuse crimes as a forensic child interview specialist. And then I spent a year doing psychological and psychosexual evaluations in Georgia. And then I spent 10 years doing in-home therapy for youth on juvenile probation. Currently, I'm the program manager for the LAUNCH program, which is a program designed to assist out-of-school youth from the ages of 16 to 24 in getting their GED. So I've had some great opportunities. So you see on this slide here, you see a picture of the United States, and you see a big pink ribbon. And for most that understand that pink ribbon is a symbol for breast cancer awareness, and the focus on today's information uh, will be geared towards um, breast cancer and um, the emotional and financial cost of that particular cancer. So why is this webinar important for the future? And you see some topics listed here, and I'm just gonna go over them real quick, just gonna dive right in. Um, the emotional and financial cost of cancer why this is important, some of the key points are the emotional and the emotional and financial trauma of a breast cancer diagnosis, the implications that compound the financial burden, preparing the unexpected, which is critical illness and subsequent policies, um, savings and loans, turning it all over, and then some tips to reduce emotional and financial stress to improve physical outcomes and treatment. So this is a little bit about my story very briefly. So I'll begin by telling you that this topic became an important matter to me. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in October of 2020, right in the top part of the pandemic. As most of you probably already know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I had always been an advocate for getting mammograms, so I just wanted to do my part. It never dawned on me that I would come out of there with a diagnosis of breast cancer. As you begin to think about things, your first thought might be, oh my gosh, I need to fight this. I need to live. I want to live. 
the financial cost of survival does not immediately register, which is why this is an important topic today. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the first poll. You would, Ms. Rita. I'm here. <laughs> go ahead, show them your next pretty slide and I'll open the poll. Okay. So <laughs> how so much pretty. does an average mammogram screening cost? A, 60 to $90, B, 100 to $250, C, 275 to $350, or D, 375 to $450? Oh, I forgot to launch it. I'm so sorry. Oh my God. Mm. I told you, Tanya, we have a great group. They're all voting. Awesome, I'm so glad you all are voting. I know. Okay. All right, why don't we give them a few more seconds and- Okay, let's keep those, let's keep those votes coming in. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to vote? Three. Two, okay, we are at seventy percent. I love to get seventy percent. I'm gonna go ahead and close it for you, and I am going to show you. And then, I guess you're gonna tell us the answer. I cannot see that screen. So where, what, what are we oh, on? Oh, you can see it. I'm sorry. This is a little crazy the way we're doing this. All right. So 6% of our attendees thought it was between 60 and 90. 20% thought it was between 100 and 250. 26 thought it was between 275 and 350. And 48% said 375 to 450. So I will hide that and you can keep going. Okay, so thank you all so much for participating in the poll. And the answer is actually B, 100 to $250. So I know that may seem shocking to some, but uh, when you look at out-of-pocket costs that may be associated with mammograms, um, that is uh, an average cost. Now, sometimes it could be higher depending on where you are and what type of mammogram you have, whether it is a 2D mammogram or a 3D mammogram. I think most, most of the time, the 3D is the preferred one now, and those may be a little bit higher. And in the past, they have... Um, ask for money up front um copay in order to uh to do that screening so thank you all so much for participating in that and so we're going to move on to the next slide and it says you've been diagnosed with breast cancer what happens next so about one in eight women will develop invasive breast cancer over the course of their lifetimes Early detection and better treatment have dramatically improved survival rates, but the cost of treating breast cancer is higher than any other malignancy. And this is according to the National Cancer Institute. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Cancer as a whole is considered a chronic illness. Although many people are living much longer thanks to medicine and treatment options, this is the point where it becomes chronic care. And it does not take long to exhaust funds when you have a chronic illness. And anybody that has a chronic illness would know that and under, understand that. Um, treatment for chronic illness can be expensive, not just for a short period of time, but over a very long period of time. So let's look at um, financial burden of breast cancer. Breast cancer is costlier than any other cancer. The cost of treatment and follow-up care can be a financial strain for a number of people and their families. 
even when you have good health insurance, more than half of people diagnosed with breast cancer face financial hardship. In 2020, medical expenditures for breast cancer were projected to reach 16.5 billion, and that's more than colorectal cancer at 14 billion, lymphoma at 12 billion, more than lung cancer at 12 billion, and prostate cancer at 12 billion. Isn't that interesting? I think many people didn't know that breast cancer was such um, a high cost cancer. So as we, um, as we look at the next part, uh, cancer produces a recurring burden each year and it's sometimes difficult to rebuild. So even a $2,000 uh, bill and spending can cripple people over the long term. Uh, many times aggressive treatment options are needed. However, the aggressive treatments such as chemotherapy, and some of you may have heard of Herceptin, they produce a new set of health problems. That means additional co-pays and deductibles from secondary conditions. I know with um, Herceptin, uh, people can, can take on um, heart issues. And so every three months during treatment, you have to have what's called a mother scan. And that's another bill that you have to pay. Uh, but that is important because that tells you what your ejection fraction rate is for your heart and to make sure that you can even continue with treatment. So all of those bills began to, to stack up for those secondary issues. I'm gonna go on to the next slide here. So you look at this, the annual out-of-pocket costs during a cancer battle. As you look at the wheel, only 11% of people are out of pocket less than $1,000. But then 20% are out of pocket more than $20,000. And even the numbers in between are still staggering for out of pocket costs during cancers. So you can see these different, and this, is, this particular model is not just for breast cancer, it is for cancer period. And so you can look at all of these amounts here and how much out of pocket costs can um, can become, and it can definitely definitely be crippling to, to, to budgets. So as we look at this next one, what is financial toxicity? And that's one of Rita's main <laughs> things there, financial toxicity. And so in this particular um, setting, financial toxicity describes the impact of direct and indirect healthcare costs that lead to significant financial burden for patients and caregivers. And it results in an increased psychosocial distress mode, diminished patient outcomes, and poor quality of life. So as we look at the direct and indirect costs, uh, first, let's look at the direct costs. Financial toxicity uh, describes the impact of direct and in indirect healthcare costs so direct costs are those frontline medical costs for things such as medical testing, therapeutic treatments, surgeries, prescription medications, doctor's fees. And if we go back and look, pres prescription medications, oh boy. Um, I remember years ago when I was prescribed um, a medication and I took the script to the pharmacy and got it filled, went back to get it. And the pharmacist said, okay, that'll be $200. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what did, what is this? And I found out that there was a coupon for it. And anytime you get a coupon for a medication, you can probably expect it's going to be costly. So without that coupon, it would have been $600. So I left that $200 medication right there. And the pharmacist was able to come around the counter, take me to the aisle and said, that medication is comprised of two things right here on the shelf. They showed me what I needed, um, the amount and everything, and I paid about $20 for that same thing. So we have to be very vigilant about the medications that we take and, and definitely ask your pharmacist you know, for assistance for those things. So the cost of cancer therapeutics have increased significantly as new drugs have entered the market. To accommodate for the rising cost, though, insurance companies have shifted a greater portion of the expenses 
to the patients in the form of increased deductibles. I'm sure you all have seen this. And then maybe restrictions and specialty medication plans and higher co-payments. So I have um, experienced that, and I'm sure you all have too, uh, at some point, um, experienced the higher co-payments. So let's look at the indirect costs. Those are the costs that occur as a result of the primary medical condition or situation, such as physical therapy, psychological therapy, income loss due to time off from work, gas, parking, and accommodations if you need to travel for treatment. And that is a huge thing because some people, uh, depending on where they live, they live a good distance from their cancer treatment centers or their infusion centers, and they may have to travel two to three hours for that treatment. And that can really take a toll on a person, um, not just mentally and physically, but also financially. And many times that may require an overnight stay because once treatment is done, travel may not be something that that person feels like doing after having had that service. In addition to those things, um, loss of employment limits access to employment-based benefits, including health insurance, which can further compound cancer-related health care costs. And furthermore, job loss is associated with an increased risk of bankruptcy. And we'll um, talk a little bit about that in just a second. So let's look here, hardships and disparity. And I'm just going to briefly um, cover this because um, I, there's no way I can include everything that I need to in this presentation due to time. But let's look at this. 36% of female breast cancer patients reported losing their job or being unable to continue working. And that was um, in 2017. So the numbers are um, significantly uh, raised at this point. And that's one thing to look at as we move into um, some of the hardships that are experienced because of cancer costs. So as we look here, um, all the way to the all the way to the far to the far right, you see bankruptcy um, at a small percentage, and at one percent. And those are things that we hope do not happen as a result of um, cancer costs, but it does happen. There's eleven percent um, that skip recommended treatments, and all of these are related to um, not being able to afford the cost associated with treatments and therapies and scans and tests and x-rays. And so sometimes it is just skipped. And that also falls into the 12% that have a lower dose of their prescription, just not able to afford it. And then we have um, avoiding doctor's appointments or follow-up tests at 12%. And, and for those um, that no, just going to the doctor, you know, despite the cost of the service itself, having that copay is something that you have to have readily available right then. And some places and doctor's offices will tell you co that copay is due before treatment is rendered. And that is important. So sometimes people skip those. Um, they struggle to buy food and a whopping 40% um, have issues with paying bills. So that is um, that is a, a lot to look at uh, for that. Now, I'm going to move into the next area because we talked a little bit about um, the, the hardships, but let's look at um, the some of the disparity, some of the disparity with it. So now, um, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Women of color with breast cancer often have worse experiences than their white counterparts. Not only do African-American women have poor health outcomes compared to whites, they also have greater financial toxicity, a lack of insurance, fear of testing, delay in seeking care, barriers to early detection and screening, more advanced stages of disease at diagnosis among minorities and unequal access to improvements and breast cancer treatment may explain the differences in survival rates between African-American and white women. 
The data from a Carolina breast cancer study found that black women diagnosed with breast cancer experienced a significantly worse financial impact than their white counterparts. Um, the disparity is actually decreasing, um, but the impact is still there. And that would be worth, um, worth an interest in further looking at that, um, those disparities, because I do think those things are changing, um, but I, I would like to know more about that. So as I, as I move forward, I'm going to be investigating that a little bit more and looking at those disparities and see how the trend is, um, how the trend is moving. So as we look at this, the adverse financial impact of that, and you can see the disparity here in the numbers. So um, any negative financial impact, 40% and 59%, decrease in income, 35 to 49, financial barrier to care, 11 to 24, transportation barrier to care, three to 14, lost job as a result of cancer, six to 14, and then one to five and lost insurance. So you can see that those numbers are, are very different. And, um, and I'd like to look, the, look more at those in the future and see how that, um, how that trends. So we know that this disproportionate financial strain may contribute to higher areas you know, of stress and lower treatment compliance and worse outcomes by race. So we've talked a little bit about the financial piece of it and I'm gonna move um, over a little bit into the implications that further compound the social, the, I'm sorry, the financial burden. So as you can see here, here's some implications that further compound situation. Co-payments for doctor visits, physical and occupational therapy visits, complementary and integrative therapy visits, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, lab workups, x-rays and other tests, wellness resources, i.e. gym memberships, lymphedema healthcare needs, such as compression garments, medicines or other health-related products, and health insurance premiums if, if paid out of pocket. So about half of people diagnosed with cancer face financial hardship because of their diagnosis. For people who develop lymphedema, the healthcare costs can be even higher. So lymphedema is an abnormal swelling that can develop in the arm or the hand or breast or torso as a side effect of breast cancer surgery or radiation therapy. As part of my surgery, I had two lymph nodes removed in my armpit as a result, I developed some mild lymphedema in my upper arm. So let's say you drive down a road every day and then suddenly one day you come to a familiar part of the road and there you find a detour sign. You find you have to go around in a different direction in order to make it to your destination. This is the way lymphedema behaves in the body. The path that the fluid travels now has to be rerouted to other areas and the detour is like the swelling point before it finds another route. As a result, here come those indirect costs that I mentioned earlier, such as physical therapy, doctor's appointments, compression garments, and other things that are needed in order to um, address those issues. So, and lymphedema can last for a short time or it can last for a long time or a lifetime. Um, you never know how that will affect you. And so, um, so there, there's ongoing treatment that would that can be needed for that particular um, issue. So I'm currently dealing with some of those things. Um, there's a, a copay each time I go for therapy, and I ended up with a 400 plus dollar medical bill that I didn't even realize was mounting on the side. It was almost like it was in hiding, but maybe really not. So when I step back. And if you look at the blocks going back here for emergency department visits or hospitalizations, uh, for anybody that is in treatment, if you have a fever of 100.4 or higher during your treatment, such as chemotherapy, um, you are uh, required to go to the hospital. You're required to go to the ER and contact your oncologist because 
that could be a sign of infection. So they would want that, they would want that assessed. And that could in turn turn into a hospitalization stay because you don't know uh, wh what exactly is causing um, that, that fever to go that high. So if any of you have been to the ER before, you know, just going to the ER, that is a bill that has to be paid. And anybody that peeks in that door and comes right on in that room, there's a cost for that. It, the ER doctor, the ER physician, um, if there is any type of surgery involved, all of those things add up and each doctor is, um, is to get paid for that service rendered. So those bills can quickly, quickly mount up. Um, so let me go to uh, the next part because we are, we've talked a little bit about the financial and some of the implications of that, but let's look at some of the emotional part of it. If we could launch the next poll, please. Okay. Let's do this. Whoops. Sorry. All right, share. All right, what percentage of women experience PTSD after a breast cancer diagnosis? Okay, people are voting. I know this is going to be interesting. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Sixty-five percent of people have voted. If you want in on the poll, now's the time to do it. I'm going to count it down: five, four, three, two, one. We will close it and share it. Okay, and you said you can't see it, so I will tell you. Okay, uh, PTSD percentages, um, 45, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, so I'm having trouble reading this. Olga, help me out here. Um, yeah. 45% uh, voted 13%, okay. 65%, 70, 33%, and 80, 14%. Okay. okay. Thank so you so much. 5%. So believe it or not, 80%. Mm -hmm. It is 80%. I don't and know about anybody else, but I believe it. It is, it is, to, it is totally true. Um, about 80% of women have PTSD symptoms after a breast cancer diagnosis. And while a full PTSD diagnosis was rare, a study found that 82.5% of women diagnosed with early stage disease had PTSD symptoms between the time they were diagnosed and the start of treatment. So let's look at some of the um, emotional trauma of a breast cancer diagnosis. So there can be nightmares or flashbacks about the cancer experience, um, continuously focusing on the cancer experience, extreme irritability, feeling numb, loss of appetite, self-destructive behaviors such as alcohol or drug abuse, being startled or frightened easily, hallucinations, memory problems, concentration problems. So if any of you know that somebody that has gone through a, a cancer diagnosis um, in the past or current, uh, and you see some of these things, um, think about that these are common symptoms um, of being diagnosed. And some of you may have experienced that yourself and, and know that, um, that these are common in that um, that if you are experiences, you're definitely not alone in any in, 
and or all of those um, symptoms. Now, you may be wondering or thinking why this is important to financial social work. If you are a social worker, you are likely to encounter people or clients who may be experiencing these symptoms and they might need other medical or mental health assistance. This brings us back around to the cost of care. So there are many people who choose not to seek professional help for emotional problems. And then you have people that are um, who cannot afford to seek professional counseling due to cost. Many people will end up with uh, rising bills for services and then abruptly end treatment due to the inability to pay. And this is a common thing. So I think of this as when you go to the doctor and if you've been prescribed an antibiotic before, and the doctor tells you to take all of it as prescribed. It could be a 10-day a um, course. And they will tell you that maybe in two to three days, you should be feeling better, but don't stop taking it because you need to complete the entire course of medication. That is somewhat like when you are getting um, professional help for um, emotional problems, because if you start and you don't finish, it may not be as effective, but many times the cost of those services um, keep people from coming in and being able to finish that course um, of the sessions that that are needed in order to be in order for it to be effective. So those are things that we uh, would like to look at more as far as uh, cost and how to receive services, and there'll be a resource list at the end. So let me go to this next one, critical illness. I don't know if any of you have heard of this before, but critical illness insurance, do I need this? So as the average life expectancy in the United States continues to increase, insurance brokers are finding ways to make sure that uh, people can afford the privilege of getting older. So critical illness insurance was developed in 1996 as people realize that surviving something such as a heart attack or stroke could leave a patient with a humongous stack of medical bills. And even with, even with medical insurance, just one critical illness, as I mentioned before, it can have a tremendous financial burden on a, a person and their family. Critical illness insurance can pay for costs not covered by traditional insurances. So some people have chosen higher deductible health plans, but they can be tricky if a serious illness arises because there would be uh, more money to pay up front. So typically how the critical illness insurance plans work is that you pay monthly for the insurance and then it can be deducted from a paycheck or some other means such as a um, debit it from an account. And what happens is whatever amount um, that you have been approved for, the insurer will receive a lump sum to cover those costs. And the coverage limits vary from maybe a few thousand to as much as $100,000. And policy pricing is impacted by a number of factors, which include the amount and extent of coverage, because even if you select a particular amount of coverage, they may or may not choose to insure you for that amount. They will look at all the information submitted and then make a determination on how um, they will uh, insure you. So they look at um, the sex, the age, and the health of the insured. And they also look at family medical um, history. And I'm gonna go ahead and move to this um, next slide here. So here are some of the things um, critical Ill illness insurance provides. Um, it provides the benefit if you experience one of the following medical emergencies. So it could be a heart attack, a stroke, organ transplants, cancer, coronary bypass. And then why, why are those things important? Why, why is it important? Some of the... Um, it says here it can pay for critical medical services that might otherwise be unavailable. It can pay for treatments that are not covered by a traditional policy. It can pay for daily living expenses, um, enabling the critically ill to focus their time and energy on getting well and not on paying bills, uh, working to pay bills. 
of transportation expenses, such as getting to and from treatment centers, um, retrofitting vehicles to carry scooters or wheelchairs, and installing lifts in the home. Terminal, terminally ill patients or those simply in need of a restful place to recuperate or to use the funds to take a vacation with friends or a family. Now, I will tell you this, and this is this is just my own um, story. Um, I, uh, I looked into getting a critical illness policy when I first started uh, my job, my current job, and I've been there 12 years. And initially, I did not, well, the agency did not have that ability to do that, but they had someone come in and I chose to go ahead and purchase um, a critical illness policy and an accidental policy. The critical illness more so because of a family history for me um, with my mom having had breast cancer. So I thought, well, I don't think that's gonna be me, but I'm gonna go ahead and purchase it anyway. So I purchased it and after a few years of having it, I thought about getting rid of it. And I actually went to HR and said, I'm thinking of um, taking this off. You know, I'm paying into it and I'm not really using it. And the HR person said, why don't you think about keeping that, you know? And I said, well, I'll go ahead and keep it for a little longer. And I am so thankful and grateful that I did because when I was diagnosed, my first thought was, I wonder if this critical illness policy that I purchased, I wonder if, if it will help. So I did my homework, did my research, and I um, called them, and, and they were like, yes, we can help. And so long story short, um, I was able to get the maximum amount of the policy that I had purchased. Uh, which was $10,000. Now, most people think that, and this was through AFLAC, and of course there are other, other systems because now we have changed over to Mutual Omaha, but there are policies that can actually help you do that. So if you have an opportunity to, to pay into that, it is not extremely expensive. And I would suggest that you consider, it, consider that because you never know when you may have uh, any of those issues and can be um, assisted through those policies. So here's some other ways to help keep costs down. Um, there are medical assistance programs um, authorized under the US Social Security Act. Medicaid is funded by the state and federal governments to provide health coverage to low income individuals and those with disabilities. And then there are clinical trials. That's an affordable way to access the latest breast cancer treatments. Clinical trials study new medications to see if they're effective. And if you meet the criteria and qualify for a clinical trial, you can access potentially life-changing treatments before they even become widely available to everyone else. And then there are also advocacy groups that can help those who are struggling with the financial implications of the diagnosis. And then there are some groups that can even provide financial assistance. And you will see that in the end when um, when Rita will display um, the resource sheet. So uh, let's look at this. And this is just a piece of interesting information. Well, at least it's interesting to me. So you see here, these are famous people that, um, that have had breast cancer. And so you see here, Robin Roberts, who's uh, from Good Morning America, Olivia Newton-John, um, Julia Dreyfus, um, Betsy Johnson, fashion designer, Christina Applegate, Amy Robach. Now she was also Good Morning America. And interesting thing about her is that she had her first mammogram on TV at 40. And she, uh, she went back and forth about wanting to do it live. And then ultimately she decided to do it. And fortunately for her, she did it because had she not gone ahead and done that, she was diagnosed during her first mammogram with breast cancer. And so, uh, so time is always of the essence when it comes to um, getting mammograms. And I keep plugging that because it is so important to do that. One year can make a difference. So 
don't skip. So we have Shannon Doherty here, actress, Wanda Sykes, the comedian, Richard Roundtree, he played the character Shaft back in the old TV series. And then we have Peter Chris, who is um, with the band Kiss, and Ernie Green, who was a fullback um, football player, and then Montel Williams. And um, one interesting thing about Montel Williams is that he was diagnosed with breast cancer and he had a double mastectomy. He went through chemotherapy, all types of treatment and finances may not have been an issue for him, but he went through all of that treatment only to find out later that he never had breast cancer to begin with. It turns out what he had was a torn pectoral muscle. Would you all imagine going through all of that only to find out it was a torn muscle? I know there are some days, you know, with, with cancer patients, you wish that would be the case. Oh, it was just a torn pectoral muscle. So we have to be very vigilant and in, um, in our uh, looking in, looking into ourselves and what we need to do for ourselves, be, um, be an advocate for your own health, um, be engaged in what is going on with your treatment. Uh, make sure you are looking at all of those things and uh, what's going on with your body and the cost of what is going on. So I'm gonna to move to this last slide. Um, there's no way I could tell you everything I wanted to tell you in the time that we have. So let's, let's look at, let's see. Okay, six ways to help manage stress after a breast cancer diagnosis. One is to partner with your doctor and get the support you need. It can be stressful not having all the information you need to make decisions about your health, but partnering with your doctor to ask questions and get information about treatment can reduce stress about the next steps. Two, tell people in your own timeline. Give yourself time to process, especially in the beginning, because you may need to prepare yourself for the emotional responses you may receive. I was told that prepare yourself, that there may be people that you know that suddenly they don't or may not want to have contact with you after knowing about your diagnosis. So those are things you have to prepare yourself for and process. Three, seek out a support system that works for you. Have, having a strong support system can provide comfort um, that may not work the same for everyone. So a good support system can be family or your friends and also include your medical team. And opening up in a group setting may be difficult for some people, but then for others, it may help to know the stories of others um, who have been through the same type experiences. So um, be mindful um, of what it is that is important to you and how that works for you. Four, do things that make you feel good, but let yourself feel all your emotions. Give your body plenty of rest and physical activity, as this can be powerful in managing anxiety. Five, get help navigating work during treatment. If your job will be affected during treatment, it's important to have an honest conversation in the workplace. Touch bases with your HR department to have a confidential meeting about what steps to take that can assist you during the process. And then six, minimize money stress. And that's easier said than done sometimes. The financial impact of a breast cancer diagnosis can add stress. So if you are having financial struggles, bring it up to the office manager or the benefit office at your hospital or the medical practice where you receive care. Most of the time, institutions, they'll be willing to work with you and help you to uh, resolve issues and even provide some, some useful resources from their department or someone else that can help you to uh, offset costs. And that is one of the main things for this is learning how to, how to offset costs and minimize stress so that the outcomes and the treatment that you're receiving that you have plenty of time to focus on your your mental and physical health and i think that is all i have right now okay 
Um, so I need there any questions. Um, give me one second, and we'll see if we have questions. Um, I am going to finish up before we do Q and A. Um, so I am the presenter. Okay, Tanya, that was just wonderful. Thank you so much. I just You're welcome. Oh, wow. I just want to close by letting people know, reminding you that we know that no one chooses to have money problems, but most people do. The good news is that no one can or needs to know everything about money, but everyone needs to know certain things about money. And as I think Tanya showed us, um, with a cancer diagnosis or some kind of long-term illness, um, we have to learn about those specific areas and those become the things that you need to know about. Um, most importantly, I try to always emphasize, just as uh, Tanya, as you're always talking about um, Uh, uh, mammograms, um, I like to remind people that we really need to teach children about money to help them be uh, successful in the future. I just want people to know that next month's free monthly webinar is on couples and money, creating an authentic financial partnership. And then July is financial problems and suicidality. We also have wonderful essays on our website written by financial social workers. If you'd like to read them, we also have quite a few free eBooks that you can download. We also have a partner program. If you refer someone to financial social, um, you get a $50 referral fee and the person making the purchase um, saves $50. It's simple and it's open to everyone. And all you have to do is click on that red dollar sign on the Financial Social Work website. So the Financial Social Work certification is self-study and self-paced. It's six months that our students have to complete it all, but most finish it in three to four. It includes all of the materials plus the final exam, and the certification renews every three years. The workbooks are really beautiful. They're heavily psychosocial. They're very interactive and reflective. And it includes 20 CEUs from National NASW. It also includes a monthly uh, Zoom meeting that we invite all of our students and graduates to. And we do have a Facebook and LinkedIn um, group for financial social work. We call it our Financial Social Work Professional Network. And so if you look at the handouts in the box in the upper right-hand corner, uh, Tanya put together some great uh, information and you can download that and have that available. Mm -hmm. Olga, do we have any questions? Yes, sure. Um, so Tonya, can you please talk about the racial disparities of the emotional cost of those who are diagnosed with breast cancer? Is the first part of question and second part, um, is there a state-by-state -state depiction of these disparities? Okay, thank you uh, for that question. Yes, um, the disparities are state-by-state um, -state, um, as far as receiving um receiving services and in that area is still um growing and a lot of it um is because um of the um inequity and in, in services um and what how it is provided so um we do have um an inequity uh of people that are um maybe um low um low income and so a lot of times um with that 
you know, with the low income, you will see a disparity in um, the services that can be received. And that's also um, across the board um, as far as um, stigma, because there are some, um, you know, African Americans that don't seek services, you know, uh, like all of our counterparts. And so that has a definite effect on um, the disparity. And there, there are things being done now to improve that and to make those trends a little bit um, different, but uh, it, it, it's gonna take a while. It is decreasing, but it's gonna take a while for, for those things to change. Thank you. Can you still uh, get critical illness policy after a cancer diagnosis? I believe, um, so the way mine was set up is that you can, you can get it. And then let's say, um, like for me, I, I used it. And I think that after um, a year, if there's been nothing new, you're fine. But let's just say there's a reoccurrence um, two years down the road you can still access that same um, policy uh, brand new, as long as you have had a clear uh, cancer-free um, diagnosis. Not, um, not sorry, not diagnosis, but a cancer-free um, uh, report. Something. Yeah, from the, from the doctor um, saying that. Now, um, you can get um, a policy after that, However, it's up to them to determine how much they want to give you. So I, I will say this for an example, and I'm just sharing all this from, from myself. I am um, a type two diabetic. And so when I did my policy, uh, they looked at that as well. And so the amount that I requested was not the amount that I was given. So they look at those things too. Um, whether or not, you know, you're type one, type two, or if you have other um, medical illnesses, they look at those things as well, because they know that these are things that, um, that they would possibly have to cover down the road. So as early as you can, I would go ahead and get those um, critical illness policies just as early as you can. And I don't think that um, already having an illness will keep you from getting one. Um, it might have something to do with the amounts, but I don't think it'll keep you from getting one. It might also um, have something to do with the cost, right, Tanya? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, with the, um, the cost with it. What they'll charge. <laughs> yes, yes, the cost of what they'll charge. Um, so again, like I did not get the full amount that I requested, but I am glad that, that they did um, accept um, a part of it. And so for that, for that amount, I was able to pay. I was able to pay for that, but I would have paid more. Um, okay, uh, Rita, do we have uh, let's, some time? Let's do... Um... Let's remind people to take the handout. And how about you have time for one more question, Tanya? I do. Um, I do want to do one more plug if I could real quick. Sure. Um, I, I did not mention the men on here. Men, if there is a history of breast cancer in your family, um, you need to be aware that uh, of that as well, because men do get breast cancer. So I just want to plug that to continue to uh, make sure that you all um, uh, be be vigilant and monitor yourselves as well. Great, thank you. All right, last question, Olga. Okay, uh, can you provide some education and clarity on the compassionate allowance? Yes. On the, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Yeah, compassionate allowance. Compassionate allowance. I don't know what that is. Do you, Tanya? I'm I'm having difficulty understanding what that is. Compassionate allowance. Compassionate allowance. Did you talk about compassionate allowance at all? I did not. 
you know, that's why you don't understand. <laughs> if right. That, <laughs> if that person's still here and you want to explain it quickly. Yes, if they're out, could they um, uh, cl clarify that a little bit more for me? Yeah, the question from Karen. Let me. She's still here? Uh, yes, uh, it's a government program, she replied. Okay, I am not totally familiar with um, compassionate allowance. Maybe it's in the resources. Okay, well, maybe on there. Um, yeah. Yeah, she, she's not connected to audio, so she can't uh, explain if we connect her. Hmm. All right, one, let's, is there one more that we can answer and finish up on the right foot? Or? Uh, she also now, I, can, I can tell you this, um, I just, <clears throat> I just looked this up, um, what she said. And what it means is uh, compassionate allowances are a way to identify diseases and other medical conditions that by definition meet social security standards for disability benefits. So I don't know fully um, about that, but um, but I appreciate you bringing that up because that is something that I will look more um, into uh, for my for my own information. And it says um, these conditions, you know, they're primarily for certain cancers and adult brain disorders. So um, I'm sure these are um, also very good um, allowances for for those uh, with, with these illnesses. Look at that. We learned something too, huh, Tonya? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you for that question. All right. Any more? One more. And we're done and out of here. I think we don't have any more questions. Just uh, as a comment, uh, it actually was the first one from Debbie that she said each of my 60 CHP treatments were $50,000. Ah, uh, wow. Wow. Okay, that left me speechless. Oh, I'm so sorry. Say sorry. that again. Olga, say that again, please. Yeah, uh, each of my six TCHP treatments were $50,000 each. Wow. I can tell you the, the costs are, are astronomical. And another, you know, um, piece of transparency is that the first surgery that I had was $130,000. And the second one that I had to have was $160,000. And so when you start looking at all of those and these treatments, um, they're so expensive. They're just so very expensive. It's, um, and, and that's when you come back to having to choose between treatment and other things that, that you need for living expenses. I mean, to pay for a mortgage or rent, you know, or food or other bills that you have. And that's where that stress comes in um, with the financial burdens of it. Wow. Okay. Financial and emotional costs of cancer. I think we covered an awful lot in a very short period of time. And I imagine, Olga, that a lot of people have written in chat to thank Tanya because this was very special. Tanya, you were terrific. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me and I appreciate it. Well, I look forward to working with you again, Tanya, and I look forward to having all of you back on one of our future monthly free webinars. Everyone take care, stay healthy, and be well. Bye Thank now. You. Thanks, Tanya. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay.